Okay, great. Uh, I'm Dave Clark. I'm with Carbon60 and very happy to be hosting the cybersecurity event uh, around uh, critical issues around legal and insurance and a number of other topics we'll cover today. Um, just so everyone's aware, I mean, normally we've uh, held these events with uh, our, our speakers in person, but obviously it was, it, this will be Zoom. The advantage of doing it in person is we get a lot of interaction and our speakers never get to finish because there's so many questions. So today we'll be doing it on Zoom and the advantage of Zoom is of course we've got people from uh, all the way, uh, lots of people on the East Coast, we have lots of people in the Toronto area, we have lots of people on the West Coast and uh, in the middle of the country we have uh, several people from Saskatchewan joining us as well. And some people even taking some time off from their Black Friday shopping in the US, visitors from Virginia and New Jersey. So happy to have all of you here. So for your information, uh, this, this is going to be recorded. And after the event, we will send you a link uh, to the recording on our website, or you can just access it there uh, without the link. Uh, but we can get to that. Um, we will be uh, probably around Monday or Tuesday, it'll take to get everything finalized, but to all of those participants who are able to stay for the day, since we couldn't have a buffet lunch for you, we will be sending you an Uber Eats uh, certificate for $30 as a thank you for uh, coming and joining us today. Um, uh, you can ask questions. Um, we are going to try and answer as many as we can. Um, so the, the process will be able to, as you ask questions, as we get to the question and answer period at towards the end of the event, we will uh, look at those and I'll look for content and maybe you know, summarize some of the questions if they're the same. So, um, so our agenda today is we're going to be, uh, as you saw there, we have uh, Michael Luters from uh, ProLink Insurance and he is the risk man leader of risk management, the senior VP. He has great perspective on the industry. Uh, I've worked with Michael for a long time. We've seen a lot of great things, uh, interesting things develop. And now, of course, with the world as it is today, it is a very trying time. And, and uh, in the insurance sector is really seeing a lot. And then we're going to have Andrew Nunes, who's the Chief Technology Chair at uh, Fasker Martineau. Um, and he's spoken with us many times and he brings a great perspective on, on many areas of, of the legal requirements that you need to look at and what's happening in the industry around cyber and you know, cloud and all the things that are such, uh, such big issues today. Um, and then finally, uh, Peter Kelly, who is our CISO and, uh, and also takes care of our, our environment and our customers internally, because we're a managed service provider, we have to have the top level of security possible. And he advises many people or organizations on security. He's been doing this for a long time. He has a lot of great viewpoints. So I'm gonna ask him a few questions and you can feel free to ask him questions as well as, as we go through that. And also ask other people within the, uh, the group, you can ask questions as well. So I'd like to start this off with, I'm gonna do two of these. I'm going to ask you on a scale of one to 10, how confident is your are your organizations about ransomware protection efforts? I'll give you a minute here to, to formulate those answers. They're coming fast and furious. Right now we have 44 people on the line. So let's uh, give you another minute or so, or not a minute. So I'm sharing those results now. Some are not very confident. We have uh, several that are in the uh, five category and six category. And no, I'm not sure if we have anyone above that or not. Yeah, we have a few up, up in that area as well. So interesting results. Uh, those who are not confident at all, hopefully we'll be able to give some guidance and get you there. Um, but uh, so right now I am going to stop sharing that. And I am going to hand off to my good friend, Michael Luters, and we will now proceed. Thank you so much, David. So thank you everybody for giving us some time here on a Friday. So I'm going to be t talking, the purpose of this is really to talk about cyber from a legal perspective. So I'm gonna be talking about it from an insurance and legal perspective because the two very much go hand in hand. So, this is kind of an interesting statistic that we've been sharing with our clients for a while now, and that is 
more and more people are carrying cyber insurance because it's now a very much a contractual requirement for a lot of organizations. Uh, why is it a contractual requirement? Well, because most organizations understand that whatever the products or services are that you're delivering are quite often dependent upon the information technology infrastructure that you're using. If you don't have access to your data, if you don't have access to your network, or maybe you're sharing a lot of information or you're sharing a lot of information with your business partners, they want to make sure that you have an insurance policy, which is why they put it into the contractual requirements, because in the event that something happens where you've spread a virus to them or your network goes down or their information that you shared with them ends up in the public realm, that they know that there's an insurance policy that's going to be there to pay that loss or, or deal with that lawsuit that happens. And so there's been a huge proliferation in the purchase of cyber insurance over the last number of years to meet these contractual requirements. Now, part of the problem has been that cyber insurance is not a product that's been widely available for a very long time. So the actuaries have not had uh, actuarial data to really know how to properly price it historically, combined with the fact that this cyber risk uh, arena is changing quite rapidly as well. So to a large degree, a lot of that historical data would have been or is irrelevant anyway. So if we look at 2020 as an example, uh, it was a very bad year for the cyber insurance market. For every $1 that was brought in in premiums in, in Canada, insurance companies paid out $4 in claims. So not a very sustainable business model. Um, but they can't withdraw that product. So it, frequently, you would probably see an insurance company withdraw that product from the marketplace when you're taking that big of a financial hit on it. The problem is, is they can't really take that product out of the marketplace because it's become so embedded in balance sheet protection uh, for publicly traded companies, you know, having some, uh, the board requiring the the company to have some balance sheet protection in the form of an insurance policy for this particular risk, um, being embedded in contractual requirements, et cetera. So, uh, so the industry has had to modify uh, the requirements and how they're underwriting this coverage to, and in the pricing of this coverage to uh, try and turn that vote around. And so you can see where we're trending in 2021 is, you know, through, uh, changing an underwriting philosophy, insisting upon certain risk controls being in place, which I'll get to in a minute, they've managed to bring that down where we look like we're trending to every $1 in premium being about $3.25 in claims. Still not a very sustainable business model, uh, but getting better. And a lot of the new risk controls that they're asking people to put in place to be insurable will probably continue to bring that down. And I suspect, uh, you know, in a year or two, you know, we'll turn the corner on this. Next slide, please. So what are the insurability requirements today to get this particular coverage? Well, I'd say it kind of falls into four big areas that are becoming quite consistent. So in the past, when you wanted to get this type of insurance, you would just simply fill out one of those awful four, six, eight page applications that really didn't ask for, well, it asked a lot of information, but frankly, it didn't ask a lot of information that was really relevant or useful to really assessing the true risk profile of an organization. So what's changed uh, in 2021 and what we're seeing is gonna be pretty much a standard requirement across the industry in 2022 is they wanna see these four risk controls in place. Multi-factor authentication, pretty much table stakes now. In fact, I would say that most insurance companies believe that the biggest positive impact of any risk control you can put in place to minimize ransomware and other sorts of uh, breaches from occurring is by having multi-factor authentication. So that one I put first for a reason, 
because in 2022, if you don't have multi-factor authentication and implemented in your organization, you will be uninsurable pretty much across the board. Some of the other things that they're looking for is security awareness training amongst your employees. Why is that? Well, because a lot of the things that happen are as a result of human error. Somebody opening up an email attachment that they shouldn't have, clicking on a, on a dangerous link that they didn't realize was a dangerous link, Un, unintentionally uh, thinking that they were emailing or on a phone call with an individual who they thought was who they said they were, but in fact they weren't and they gave up their password, you know, inadvertently. So, so, so training your employees to become more aware of the different types of tricks and things that these criminals are using, you know, being able to scrutinize an email to a greater degree or knowing kind of what to look for on a website uh, before you click on that link goes a long way to mitigating a lot of claims from occurring. So they want to see that all your employees are getting this training at least once a year. Uh, that's what's going to be today. I suspect in the future they're going to want to see not only training, but there's also going to be some testing around the effectiveness of that training is what I'm going to basically predict. The third thing that they're not asking for in all cases, I would say it very much depends on the on your industry segment, but an air gap on your data backup. Why is that? Well, because initially when ransomware was happening, um, a lot of people weren't very diligent in their backups. So then people became very diligent in their backups. So when they got hit with ransomware, they wouldn't pay the ransomware because they would say, well, we'll just wipe everything out and we'll just restore all our data from our backups. Well, of course, cyber crime is a, is a cat and mouse game. So as the protections and policies, procedures, et cetera, get better. Well, the criminals, of course, adapt to that. So what did they start doing? They started encrypting your backups first. So they would say, well, sure, go. Go try and restore from your backups. And then you would discover that your backups were actually encrypted as well. So the reason why uh, some, not all insurers, but an increasing number of insurers, I suspect in 2022, are going to be looking for some sort of an air gap on your backup is because if that and an air gap I'm sorry means that your your backup is not connected to your network so it could be on a on a hard drive that disconnected from your network on tapes yes believe it or not tapes are coming back or even in some cases uh, you know cloud providers will offer that as an option well they'll actually keep an off a uh, disconnected a version of your backup somewhere else in their network that you'd have to contact them to actually get access to. But why are we doing that? Well, because at least if that if you have a backup that's disconnected to you, to the network, it's probably safer and you'll have a greater potential to restore your data from that as opposed to paying a very expensive ransom. And the fourth item, which again is pretty much becoming table stakes from an insurability perspective, is that all your data is encrypted. It's encrypted while it's in transit, it's, it's in, and it's encrypted while it's at rest. Uh, so uh, these are kind of the four things. Again, it'll vary a little bit, but I would say uh, these are the four key things that any insurance company is going to be looking for in 2022. And, you know, again, let's bring this back to what the topic is today, which is around, you know, legal and legal liability. There is probably a growing expectation, and I'm not going to steal Andrew's thunder today because I, I, I think he's going to go into this in more detail. But it comes down to a question around what would be reasonable for your partners, your customers, uh, your vendors, uh, et cetera shareholders, <laughs> private equity firms that have invested in your business, whatever. What would be deemed reasonable level of risk control to be in place? And so when something happens, when a breach happens, of course, that is when these questions start to occur. Well, what did you have in place to prevent this? Well, why weren't these things in place? Well, considering what we do or what business you're in, it would have been reasonable, it's common practice, it's a, do a well-documented best practice that these things would have been in place. So when these things aren't in place, so take the insurability out of it for a second and about your ability to get insurance, the second question comes down to, of course, is what's your legal liability as a director and officer of the company? Or 
what level of defense will you have with your partners when there's a breach that occurs and they don't deem that you had very reasonable controls in place to protect them. So it's really kind of a two-pronged uh, problem. The other thing that you're seeing here is I've listed two uh, companies called BitSite and Security Scorecard. So the other thing that insurance companies uh, have started to do, which in many ways is a big pain in the butt for a broker like us, but very smart, I think, for those organizations is that they are uh, enlisting the services of organizations like this who have tools that they use to do an external scan of your network. So they will be able to tell whether you have any open ports on your firewall. They'll be able to tell if there's any critical security patches that haven't been installed on your server or your firewall. Uh, they go out to the dark web and they see if there's any uh, passwords that are currently for sale from employees of your organization. So they use tools from these sorts of organizations to, as an underwriting tool to determine your insurability and to determine what your risk profile looks like. In some respects, it's very smart. And uh, unfortunately, they don't share though, they will run these reports, but they don't share those reports with us as a broker and they usually won't share it with you as a policyholder or somebody seeking a quote either. So we're actually working on some solutions right now to try and be proactive on that to make sure we get this information before the underwriter does because once they get this report and they've identified all these vulnerabilities in your organization, you can't, uh, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube you know, at that point. Um, the perception around your organization, how you manage risk has already been set. Next slide, please. So, Depending on your industry sector, in addition to the things that I just, the four items I just outlined, there are potentially other insurability requirements that are going to be there. And again, these are some, these are, we are increasingly seeing these requirements put into contracts. And in some cases, um, it could be, again, a reasonable expectation that you have these things. So I've just listed a couple of key sectors, healthcare, of course, because health records are highly valuable, financial services, retail, anybody who's an MSP or data hosting where you're hosting or storing the data of others or managing the security around that data for others. The insurers want to see that you have been audited to some recognizable standard, such as ISO 27001, a SOC audit, NIST, if you're processing credit card transactions, that some third party has come in, taken a look at how and documented how you're managing the risk uh, around credit card transactions and what you're storing and how you're storing and how you're transmitting so that's your PCI compliance, et cetera. So again, if you're in one of these higher risk categories, the requirements to be insurable is gonna go up. But again, we're also seeing the requirements of, of uh, many of our clients in these higher risk segments to also, it's in contracts and agreements that they have to get audited to these standards and have to maintain the, the credentials to these various standards. So it's gonna go above and beyond that. Next slide, please. So, you know, what are some of my uh, predictions for the future? Uh, around what's going to happen with cyber insurance and to some degree um, how it's going to impact in a lot of cases your contractual requirements. Well, the first thing I can pretty safely say is I think the rates for this coverage are going to continue to increase because they have to find the right equilibrium between, you know, pricing adequately for the risk and, you know, and the risk controls that are reasonable to be expected to be in place. So I think it's gonna be a combination of the two. The things I talked about in my previous slide in combination with rate increases. Number two is ransomware has just become such a big problem and in, based on some statistics is 60% of the claims that insurance companies see, I think ransomware is a coverage that's gonna become optional. So a way to control the cost of the coverage, of course, is to remove one of your key coverage areas, which is ransomware. And what the insurers will probably do is say, okay, we can offer you, you know, we can reduce the cost of this product, but we're gonna take this coverage out. If you want this coverage, we're gonna now underwrite you to a higher degree, and there'll obviously be an additional cost to add that coverage back in. 
it will be very unfortunate when that happens because it is one of the primary risks that all organizations have because ransomware has become one of the most profitable in your basement businesses in the world. Um, you can sit here in your fuzzy slippers and uh, t-shirts and shorts all day in another country and make literally thousands and thousands of dollars a day uh, launching ransomware attacks on people. So um, we're not out of the woods with respect to that. The other prediction I have, and I, and I don't think this is gonna be a 2022 thing, but I can see it coming in 23 or maybe even 2024, is what we call parametric pricing. So as you saw in one of my previous slides that, that insurers are starting to utilize the services of third-party organizations to monitor your risk profile in real time, I think what insurers are gonna start doing is monitoring you when you're a policyholder in real time and when they get flagged of certain vulnerabilities that have emerged, that they will maybe, for, for example, give you a very limited amount of time to address it. And if you don't address it, the cost of your coverage is gonna go up or maybe certain uh, coverages in your policy will be removed. Uh, so that's what I mean by parametric pricing, where maybe you're paying for the coverage on a monthly basis and the price of that coverage goes up and down based on you know, data elements that they're collecting about you and uh, really pricing the coverage in real time or maybe uh, based on a peer group of people in your organizations. So I think this is gonna become a lot more sophisticated as, as time goes on. And again, that's going to create some contractual issues because again, um, if you've agreed, for example, that you are gonna have coverage or you're gonna have a certain amount of coverage or certain coverages included in your policy, if an insurer has the ability midterm to simply modify, remove, um, cancel, et cetera, midterm, because your risk profile changed, that's gonna cause a lot of disruption in the marketplace. So uh, I don't know exactly how it's all gonna play out, but uh, these are three things I have a pretty high level of confidence on moving forward. Thank you, Michael, that's great. Over, over to you. Uh, fantastic. Um, I'm gonna launch another, our second question of the day. Um, on if your company suffered a cyber breach now that we've talked a lot about it, how long do you think it would take your company to bring you back online? Questions are coming in fast and furious answers, I should say. Getting closer. So I think we've had 35 of the 52 people answer the question, or 36 now. Going, going, and poll, and share results. So the majority of you uh, feel that 53% uh, of you feel one day you could bring your, your, organiz bring your organization back. And uh, one week, and I don't know, is a pretty good answer as well. And those of you who are going at one hour, you've got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot in place to help you do that. And there's a, a lot to consider when you're going to be have a fail over that quickly. And uh, it's not inexpensive to do, but it's, uh, it's well worth it. And one day is not is a good number if you lo lose data. Uh, certainly when we get to one week and, and beyond, it, it becomes a real problem. So on that note, I am going to... Uh, my technical abilities. So now I am very happy to present Andrew Nunes and, uh, from Baskins and uh, have Andrew speak to uh, what we want to go through today, Andrew. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. I'm going to be talking about the critical legal cybersecurity issues. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, it'll just show you a little bit of what we're going to talk about. Don't get too nervous. I know it's a long list, but uh, we don't have to get to everything. And we certainly won't get to do a deep dive on much, if anything, today. But at least I'm hoping to give you a sense 
for what's going on and what uh, how we deal with this in my world, which increasingly is overlapping with Michael's world. And it's nice to see actually how the two worlds are starting to converge. A lot of the things that Michael talked about do align nicely with the, the advice that I end up having to uh, help clients through. I'll, I'll uh, point out in particular, uh, item number 10, it's my favorite, loving your contract and your lawyer. So I'm hoping that we definitely get a chance to uh, speak about that. If, uh, if I can do that, then, then I'm good. Uh, next slide, please. So just kind of setting the stage here, we're, we're talking about cybersecurity. Um, we're talking about unauthorized access to data and, and data is great, uh, but data can also be detrimental. And I know it's the currency of the day, et cetera, et cetera, but kind of going in, you have to think that the more personal information in particular that you have, the bigger the risks are for you and for your business, right? And if you don't have a good plan of how to use it, then you know you got to think hard about what you what you're going to do. Um, think hard about whether or not you're going to keep all that data, and you got to think about all your legal restrictions on having that data, um, and and most particularly personal information, uh, but other data as well. Like it's not a free for all, although data is available almost without limit these days. Uh, there are certain obligations that come with it. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention just real quickly at this point, uh, and we'll get a little bit deeper into the uh, legal requirements in a minute, but just in terms of the amount of data, the laws actually do prohibit the amount of data that you should be collecting and that you should be keeping, and the reasons why you should be getting it, and we can't lose sight of those things. Like We should only be collecting personal information for purposes that are reasonable. Um, if it's not a reasonable purpose or that purpose is not properly disclosed or if you don't have consents, then you shouldn't be having that kind of personal information, right? And you should only limit collection to what's necessary for the purposes that you've identified. So, um, you know, the, the point here at the end of the day is that it's not a free for all. You have to be careful. You have to be mindful. Don't just keep data for data's sake. Um, there are costs associated with that. Next slide, please. So what are we talking about? Data breaches have been around for a long time. It's unauthorized access, unauthorized disclosure, um, could be personal information, other sensitive data. Um, but if your systems are breached or the systems of a third party that you rely on are breached, you're in breached uh, territory. And uh, certainly one of the, the key risks that you have to keep in mind is that risk of a breach. And things are just getting worse and worse. Uh, when we look at what's going on out there, we see that cyber attacks are up 400% from the first quarter of 2018 to the end of 2020. So, you know, that's the reason why insurance can't go away because <laughs> this problem isn't going away, it's getting, it's getting worse. Um, and there are different threats out there, but as Michael mentioned, ransomware seems to continue to be uh, the most desired flavor for the times. And uh, even ransomware is getting worse and it's evolving, it's, it's changing. Um, we see this, for example, in the recent attack by Revel, where there was uh, infiltration into the system and they exfiltrated the information, put it on the dark web. There ended up being an auction for that information. And, uh, and then the ransomware demand was made, it was actually $50 million. And if it wasn't paid after eight days, it went up to $100 million. So you can just see how things are getting worse and worse and what the trend is looking like here. It's, it's no joke. And there are other trends, but the other thing that people are paying more attention to these days as well is the idea of supply chain risks. So hackers these days, they're trying to find the weakest link in the chain of supply and that may or may not be you. If it's you, then you might be the cause of um, a whole domino effect of breaches, or you might be the, uh, the victim of someone else who was the weakest chain in the link and they get hacked and somehow that comes back to bite you. So these things are very real. They're very expensive, uh, something you really have to take seriously and focus on. Next slide, please. So what, what are some of the things that happen? Um, and you'll be familiar with this, but just to 
set the table again. You know, there's business interruption, loss of business, third party claims, class action lawsuits. There's class action lawyers out there just waiting to pounce on the next breach, signing people up to the class and getting as much money as they can. You're going to incur lots of costs. There may be fines. You may lose competitive advantage if the information that was breached happened to be trade secrets. You might be embarrassed. There's a ton of things that can happen. Many of you will have heard about the, uh, the Marriott Hotels breach, which happened some time ago, but we're still seeing how that is playing out on the company even today. Um, when, when that breach happened, their stock price fell 5% in pre-market trading. And if you look at their market cap, that's, that's no small deal. That's important. That's significant. Um, all 50 states opened up investigations. Federal agencies opened up investigations. They were fined for the equivalent of $24 million. Like it's, it's a big deal. It's nothing that you can just uh, take casually. Next slide, please. So this graph here just, you know, it shows the trend perhaps in a, a more striking way. You'll see that in the year 2020, so just last year, how there was a huge spike in the total value received by ransomware, right? And, and this is just for the things that we know about. A lot of companies are not going to report that they've been hit with a ransomware demand and or whether they've paid it. So even from among those that we know about, you can see how much ransomware attacks and the money that's being paid out um, is trending in a very significant way. It's almost hockey stick trend. Next slide, please. Okay, um, let's start delving into what some of the laws are out there that you have to be mindful of in the different areas. And, and let's start with privacy because privacy is what most people think about. Those are the breaches that are the most high profile because individuals are impacted. It's your financial institutions, um, your, like your hotels in the case of Marriott, the Starwood Hotels database and others. So you have to be familiar with the federal legislation in Canada, which goes by uh, the acronym PIPDA. And then there's also provincial legislation in, in BC, Alberta and Quebec. Um, you also need to be aware of not just your local laws, but if you are doing business in any way, shape or form, in other jurisdictions, you have to think about foreign laws now. And most companies are, you know, given the internet, <laughs> um, they're not just limited to Canada. Like you're, there's a good chance you're doing business in Europe or in South America or in Southeast Asia. So you now have to be mindful of GDPR in Europe. If you have a single customer that is um, a European data resident, you've got to comply with GDPR. And if you don't, there's possible significant consequences. Um, California, very strict privacy laws there. Uh, also something you have to keep in mind if you have customers uh, in the US or other business dealings in the US. And it just keeps popping up. I think, you know, just a little while ago, you know, you get reports of new legislation in Thailand. Um, and so pretty soon, anywhere you do business is going to have their own regime that you're going to have to think about, become aware of. And, and to comply with. Uh, and then in addition to the actual privacy laws, there are industry specific statutes and regulations. So again, more that you have to be aware of. If you're in the healthcare sector, there's HIPAA. If you're in the financial sector, there's the OSFI guidelines, generally for outsourcing, as well as for cybersecurity uh, breaches and, and other steps that you have to take if you're a financial institution. Um, if you are, a uh, publicly traded company, then you have to be concerned about the guidelines that are put out by the CSA. Um, so there, there's no end to where the laws and the regulations are coming from. Next slide, please. Okay, so the other thing to keep in mind is that it's not just the legislation, it's not just the regulations, right? There are other legal concerns that you have to be mindful of. 
So for example, even if you don't have personal information, you might say, I'm good. I don't have to worry about this too much. But you probably have trade secrets, right? Your business is probably thinking of things that are intended to give the company a competitive advantage in the marketplace. That information is on your systems. If that gets hacked, your trade secrets get out there and trade secrets are only protected under IP law by the virtue of them being secret. Once they get out there, there's no protection, right? Unless you have layered on patents and the like, but if it's a true trade secret, the value is because it's kept, it's kept secret, it's kept confidential. That can be compromised uh, and that could have significant negative impact on your business. Uh, another example, most businesses, when you enter into agreements with customers or suppliers, you'll sign an agreement and it's typically going to have confidentiality provisions. And those provisions will say, hey, I'm giving you some of my confidential information. You have to keep that confidential. confidential. Um, you either have to take a certain amount of effort to keep it confidential, or sometimes you might have even agreed to a confidentiality clause that says, there's a strict obligation for you to keep it confidential. Wouldn't suggest that you do that because, you know, as they say, as it relates to breaches, it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. But nevertheless, the point here is that you probably owe obligations and commitments to third parties to keep their information confidential. So it's not just the privacy law. You might be opening yourself up to claims by others that you deal with in the context of your business if you allow the information that they've given to you to be subject to unauthorized disclosure, unauthorized access. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is in addition to privacy laws, there's increasing focus on corporate governance requirements. There are corporate laws out there that will govern most companies and there are requirements under those corporate laws. And we are gonna get into that some more in just a little bit, all right? So next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna delve into just some of the, the core principles under the privacy legislation for those who are not familiar. Um, and, and one of the core principles under the privacy legislation as it relates particularly to cybersecurity is there's a key principle that you have to have appropriate safeguards in place to protect information. And those safeguards are based on the sensitivity of the data. Okay? So the requirement's gonna vary depending on your circumstances, but there's a requirement nonetheless. Okay? So depending on the amount of data you have, depending on what the distribution of that data is, what format it's in, and Michael made reference to encryption, um, the method of storage, all of those things will impact the types of security measures and safeguards that you have to have in place. So the more sensitive the information, the higher level of protection that it's gonna require. Um, interestingly, some of the guidance that came out on this um, from the privacy commissioner, and, and that's another point, right? It's not just the legislation, but the privacy commissioners and other regulators are con consistently and constantly coming out with new information that you have to be aware of. So, so way back when, you probably remember the Ashley Madison breach. You know, when that happened, some people were snickering, some people were sweating, but when, when that got hashed, um, got hacked, um, they came out, the privacy commissioner came out with a lot of guidance and they started talking about, uh, you know, the extent to which you should have multi-factor authentication, which Michael made reference to. So that came up in that context. Now we're seeing it flow into the insurance realm where it becomes one of the criteria for insurability. So do you need two-factor authentication? Do you need three-factor authentication? The privacy commissioner talked about encryption. Um, so all these things are part of your legal obligation and establish what is the extent of your obligation in terms of having appropriate safeguards in place. Um, what else do we need to be thinking about? Uh, just recently, uh, the privacy commissioner came out with guidance um, saying that you also, in addition to all the things that are part of the legislation, you also now have to think about the attractiveness of your data. 
So even if it's not personal information or highly sensitive information, if it's the type of thing that people really want to get at because it's in vogue, um, you might have a higher obligation to protect that information, right? But one way or the other, having appropriate safeguards is key. And those safeguards have to be physical, they have to be organizational, and they have to be technological. Right. Next slide, please. Okay. So having appropriate safeguards, one of the cornerstones, one of the key principles under privacy law. Um, what else? So not that long ago, they amended the privacy legislation to introduce breach notification requirements. So now if you are breached and it reaches a certain threshold, you have to report, you have to notify. Right. And the graphic that you see on the right hand side of this slide kind of just you know, shows the rationale why they had to introduce breach notification legislation. A lot of organizations that had been hacked were taking a long time to notify people. So you can imagine if you're an individual and your information has been breached and it's out there, it's on the dark web, it's being sold, it's being auctioned, it's being used in a very negative way. It's probably not acceptable that it's been five days, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, sometimes more than 70 days before you find out about that. So the breach notification legislation came in to try to address this. So anytime there's a breach and there's a real risk of significant harm, so that's the test under the privacy law, a real risk of significant harm, then it triggers the obligations. You have to notify the affected individuals. You have to report to the privacy commissioner. And depending on the circumstances, you may also be obligated to notify any third party organization that is in a position to help mitigate that risk of harm. And if you don't comply with these, you're in breach of privacy laws. So this has to be part of your breach response plan, making sure that you satisfy the notification and reporting obligations under privacy law. Right. Different provincial uh, regimes have their own, healthcare has its own. So, you know, not just the one place uh, item that you have to look. So this slide here, thank you very much. Now we're just, we're looking at the full picture, right? So we talked about the safeguards, physical, organizational, technological, those are all dictated by the legislation. Privacy law, you gotta do it. But in addition to those things, there are other risk mitigation activities that you should be engaging in. And Michael already touched on some of these. And again, good to see how things are um, coming together. So you'll see the ones that we've listed, education training, auditing, monitoring, having appropriate business continuity and disaster recovery planning the contract, which we're gonna to get to, and of course, insurance. Um, some of the more recent ones that I've seen, for example, the Canadian Securities Administrators, in their recent guidance, which came out not too long ago, they're also talking about having written policies and procedures, doing risk assessments, having an incident response plan, and doing appropriate due diligence. And the due diligence is gonna be key. Due diligence is increasingly one of the things that people are focusing on. So even before you put yourself in the situation where you have exposure, do you know what you're getting yourself into? Is it appropriate? Have you taken steps to address the shortcomings, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I made reference earlier on to corporate governance and said we'd get back to that. So this is that. Companies are going to have exposure if there's a breach, no doubt about it, right? And we talked about the different areas of exposure. But there is increasing focus now on the exposure that directors and officers have if in fact the organization suffers a security breach. And this is not new because going 
way back, like even to the Equifax breach, which was some years ago, you know, you'll remember that all of the directors and officers, they resigned, like they were essentially forced to resign. Um, now they weren't sued in that case necessarily, but you know, one of the major shareholders was encouraging everyone else to withhold their vote in favor of the current board based on the fact that they allowed the breach to occur. So you will be under more scrutiny if you have a high ranking position within the company. And even if you don't, you can expect that those who do will be flowing down that pressure to whoever is ultimately responsible for a breach incident. And uh, it was just last week, in fact, there was a ruling that was issued by a Delaware court, again, in the Marriott case, happened a long time ago, but there were a number of, of derivative actions that came out of that. So, so Marriott was actually sued by one of their major shareholders, and it was a suit not just against the company, but also against the directors and the officers, because you have to understand that under um, corporate law, directors and officers, they have a duty of care. They have to act in the best interest of the corporation, which includes the duty to exercise reasonable care and diligence in the exercise of their duties, um, which is ultimately to manage and control the corporation. They delegate that down to management, but it is still ultimately their obligation, their responsibility as a matter of corporate law. And so in this case, the directors were challenged on whether or not they had they met that duty. And even though it was in the US, it's a similar concept down there. Um, now, fortunately in that case, the directors were found to have met the duty because they um, had a focus on cybersecurity. Like it was an agenda item for the board of directors. So they could say, hey, no, no, we, we didn't ignore this thing. We were paying close attention to this. Um, they were also found to not be liable because they sought uh, outside expertise, right? They didn't just say, well, I'm not so familiar with this. I don't understand it. I don't know what these young people are doing. Let's just move on with business. No, they sought out the, the expertise. They got people in there to educate them, to uh, let them understand the risk so that they could manage in this area appropriately. And then they made sure that the organization took appropriate steps. But had they not done those things or other things as appropriate, they could have potentially been found liable in their personal capacity, okay? Um, we also talked about the secondary market liability. So if your company gets breached, it's a public company, share price goes down, as a director officer, you didn't get, uh, you didn't take appropriate action, shareholders are probably coming after you. And we see how uh, in the securities realm with the guidance that they're coming out with, there is also a focus in this area. The OSFI guidelines, again, this is for financial institutions. They also clearly say that cybersecurity needs to be a board level issue. It starts at the top. And if you're not dealing with it at the top, then you're gonna have exposure and potentially personal exposure as a director or officer, All right? Next slide, please. Okay, so we've talked about kind of the legal risks that are out there, the obligations. How do you mitigate risk from a legal perspective? One of your key risk mitigation areas or methods is gonna be your contract, all right? This is why you have to love your contract. It's going to be key for you. As Michael mentioned, your contract will um, probably require you to have insurance. I don't know what's gonna happen, Michael, if. Yeah, you have to have insurance and then that insurance goes away because the person who's insured didn't continue to meet the required standards. It's, it's good to understand that prediction because we have to now start thinking about how we deal with that in these contracts. But there's a number of things that you have to think about because your contracts are gonna be a critical component of your, mis, of your risk mitigation strategy. It's not the full story by any means, but it is an important part. And it's not the easiest thing to deal with. Um, if you are in the cloud space, uh, you know, cloud agreements and cloud providers, they generally don't, or at least they say they don't, provide for customized solutions. And then they extend that to say they don't provide for customized contracts. They won't be quick to negotiate things with you. 
right? So you have to do your diligence. You have to understand what protections you're getting under the contract, what protections you're not getting under the contract. Try to negotiate for better protections and whatever gap is left, you have to figure out a solution for that, okay? The contract's not gonna be the be all and end all, although it's very important. And don't assume that the contract is gonna provide all the answers. Um, so you have to think about these things. Representations and warranties and covenants. What is the vendor committing to in terms of the safeguards that it is implementing for the system that you are getting? Are they committing to notifying you about a breach so that you can then fulfill your breach notification obligations under privacy law? Are they helping you to otherwise comply with your legal requirements in all the areas that we already talked about? Um, sometimes you'll, you know, they'll take different approaches to things. Uh, sometimes they'll just rely on an ISO certification or they'll say that we're SOC compliant or they'll provide an annual SOC report about their internal controls. Uh, and, and you know, that's all you're gonna have to rely on. You, know, you still have to be careful there. Not all SOC reports are the same. The scope of, not, of all SOC reports is not the same. Uh, don't take it for granted. There's criteria under there and not all of them uh, address the full criteria. They don't all get up to privacy and security. Some of them stop shy. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful about what data is being covered. Sometimes they try to limit the scope of data that's covered, the scope of data that's under their responsibility, or they try to limit the level of commitment that they have. So they're only gonna make a certain amount of effort to keep your data secure. You know, they're gonna take efforts consistent with industry practice. Okay, well, what's industry practice? What does that mean? Does that include, you know, the, the one person security shop that started yesterday? Or are we talking about, you know, the bigger players? Do you have clarity in, and certainty in this area? Next slide, please. I've only got a couple more minutes so, uh, but, but we're almost near the end. Um, what are some of the other things that you have to be thinking about when you're doing contracts? The extent of liability um, that the service provider is signing up to, right? They're typically not gonna be responsible for any and all data incidents because again, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but they'll sign up for particular obligations. If they breach those obligations and there's a, security incident, then they'll generally be responsible for that to some extent. But you have to ask yourself, what kind of damages are they responsible for? Is it only quote unquote direct damages or are they also responsible for indirect damages, which might be things like the cost of breach notification, the cost of damage control, the cost of providing the affected individuals with credit monitoring and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You really need to understand where they are accountable and where they are not, and then fill the gaps. And a multitude of other things that you have to look at. Is there a cap on their liability? Um, is there an extended cap on their liability in this particular area as it relates to cybersecurity, which is one of the things that we generally see? Um, are they excused from their cybersecurity obligations in the event of force majeure? Well, should they be getting around force majeure because they've got appropriate redundancies and things of that nature. Um, if the, your data is compromised, what are they doing to help you recover that? So there's a lot of things to think about in the contract. Next slide, please. So it's, it's 12.55, I wanna be respectful of the time. Um, I won't get into this, but you know, to the extent you're interested, the next few slides, they really just set out some of the types of things that uh, are likely to be the consequences of a breach. And in the contract, you have to think through whether or not you have coverage for these things or whether or not you are covered for these things by your insurance or you're taking other risk mitigation to address these things. So if we go to the next slide on this, please. All right. So just quickly, as we're looking at that, damage control, compensating individuals, third-party claims, which we talked about. Next slide, please. Don't have to rush too much, Andrew, we're good. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, uh, fines and penalties, right? Again, Marriott got fined almost $32 million. Who's gonna pay that? <laughs> uh, is your, does your contract allow you to recover that or not? 
Um, and if not, what are you doing about that? Call center support, remedial actions. What about the hit that you take to your reputation? Who's going to compensate you for what you need to do there? Do you have to launch a marketing campaign to help to recover that? Um, are, you are you losing customers as a result of the breach? Your reputation has been damaged and now it spills over to your revenue. You're losing profits. You know, to what extent is that covered? Do you have your eyes wide open going in? And vendors are not, they're going to say, we are not in, we're not your insurer, right? So they're not going to take on full and uncapped um, liability for these things, but you need to understand the extent to which they are and the extent to which they're not. And then if you get breached, trust me, you're going to have a lawyer at your door. You're going to have a breach coach, hopefully. You're going to have other subject matter experts that are helping you get through this, depending on the severity of it. Um, and are those the responsibility or the accountability of, of who? Who's, who's swallowing that? And then, of course, the ransomware amounts. Next slide, please. So... So I'm actually, I'm actually done um, and at the appropriate time, happy to take questions. So I hope this was helpful in terms of giving you kind of an overview of the legal landscape, some of the things to think about from a legal perspective and an overall risk mitigations perspective and how it all comes together. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Dave. Uh, that's absolutely wonderful, uh, Andrew. As always, um, a, great se a great segment and uh, we can't, uh, as in our organization, we're very proud of our uh, of how we operate, and and uh, but we really, if, no matter who your service provider is, challenge them. You know, make sure that you're challenging them. It's their responsibility. Do they have the right practices in place? Do they have the right security in place? Do the, do their contracts address it? Um, we've seen it live, uh, unfortunately, where organizations are. Are struck and the service provider wasn't able to even didn't have cyber insurance we've seen it um and and that happens so we just uh, you know keep it it's real and uh, there's no doubt to what we're going through is happening every single day we're experiencing it and i can speak from experience of being in the dr business for a long time that uh is nothing worse than going through a cyber breach it's it's horrible it's worse than a building blowing up really because it's easier to recover uh, that way if you can just fail over but a cyber breach is much more different so on that note i'd like to introduce you to peter kelly and as i mentioned earlier peter is our CISO here at carbon 60 and helps and has been with the organization since its inception he's one of the founders of carbon 60 um and uh he continues to pr help protect us i say he wears the cape here he makes sure that when we have uh, uh organizations that need help or are in desperation that he's the one that they can come to and along with just our normal processes uh so i'm going to ask you peter uh, a question and by the way please uh if you're in the audience and you have questions of anybody on the panel please submit them and uh don't be shy we'll uh, try and get to them and i'll monitor them and uh, try and get it what we can in this live Last, uh, 15 minute period and we'll and because I've, I've got more questions that's for sure so Peter as you're looking towards you know you've been doing this for a long time we know not just not to count your age or anything like that but uh, in your you know you've seen a lot you've seen the evolution of what's happened when you look in your crystal ball which I know you have sitting there beside you what do you see as the future of, of you know, this crime and, and what's happening? What's the next big thing we should be wary of and, and watching out for? Well, thanks, Dave. And special thanks to both Michael and Andrew. Um, all great points. And, and you guys covered it really, really well because it's, it's stuff we're seeing over and over again and stuff we're actually experiencing with our customers. Um, obviously, I could talk about a lot of this stuff for days, but I'm going to try to keep this one short. Um, first off, there is no cake. Um, uh, you, Dave, you're the one that wears the cape, not me. Um, the thing, the thing that that it keeps happening over and over again in in the threats that uh, that have always existed is the insider type threats in the social engineering. Whether it's someone being taken advantage of because of a social engineering or a phishing type of attack, uh, it's always the weakest link. Or if, if a malicious user. Either way, those things are are, are a common theme that we're seeing over and over again. You can have all the firewalls, all the controls in place, but if an inside user that has direct access to data either doesn't understand the processes or what what's expected of them, or ignores the processes, that's where we're going to see issues. So that's why 
we, we focus on security on the outside and on the inside as well. Those tacks um, are continuing to evolve and we're still seeing it from anywhere from random phishing to very, very specific and targeted type of tacks on people because of other data breaches. So one site gets hacked, like that, that's where these guys talked about the, the um, supply chain attacks. Those are cascading effects and it's, it's, it's a constant uh, thing that we're seeing. And the bad guys are going to continue to build on that information from other breaches and it's going to support the, uh, the future breaches. Things like multi-factor are, are a common stake for, for insurance and, and it, it slowed things down, but it's not stopped. It's not, hasn't stopped it and it's going to continue to evolve. Great. So, so Peter, and I'm just going to slide because I know we do some of these, I don't know, we do a lot of services, but I'll just put that up just as, as a reference for the audience. But you know, someone, an organization comes to you or you go to an organization, what, are, can you name like two key things that you just have, you know, you just have to do today? Um, well, what's actually not on this slide because it's, it's a service we don't provide, um, but it is something we do because of, because of our responsibility is security, uh, cyber awareness programs and making sure people understand what is expected of them um, what their responsibilities are, uh, making sure they, they clearly understand what their responsibilities are, and then test, test our folks. Like we, we test our folks on a regular basis with test fish, but we're getting more and more um, sophisticated with the tests we're, we're trying to provide. Um, so it's not just an audit time that somebody says, this is what is expected of me and this is, this is how I do it. No, it's a, it's a, it's a thing that, that our folks have to live and breathe every single day and, and security awareness and the responsibility is not just the security folks in our company, it's every single employee and every single contractor. Yeah, I know we have a really good policy in that place here. I've been, I've been tested many times on our, uh, on, through our uh, security uh, training program that uh, actually puts us to the test all the time. The, the one thing I also wanna point out, all the stuff that's up there on the slide, it, there isn't one, one service or one function that that solves everything. It, it, security is a layered approach and you have to have multiple layers because you will have failures in one or more layers at any one time. The one thing that I want to stress that's not on the here because it's not typically security is is your backups. And it's not a matter of, I think it was it was Andrew or Michael that said um, it's not not a matter of if, it's when you get breached, how bad it's going to be and how prepared you are. And there has to be more focus on, on folks to prepare for those breaches and the remediation of that. And you need to test their backups. You may, need to make sure your, your backups are air gapped. You need to make sure that everything is backed up, that you have the ability of restoring. And that is not, again, a security thing. That's, that's the storage guys usually take care of the backups, but you have to make sure that storage guys are engaged on a regular basis to, to test those more frequently. And, and the incident response plan needs to be evolved so that you're actually embedding the, the, the restoring and the testing of the restorers and making sure that the data is where it needs to be when you expect it to be there. And, and a lot of those departments have to actually work together better. Yeah, I can certainly speak to the uh, experience that I've had over the years of, of getting organizations to test and repeatedly test is, is key. And when you're testing, you should be regularly testing your backups. And there's a lot of, within the software that's available today, there's lots of ways to do restores very effectively and bring the data back so that you, have a, you know you have a good data. But when you get into things such as, you know, disaster recovery and failovers when something to allow, those are really, uh, you know, at a minimum once a year, you need to be making sure that you're doing that. Um, and, and there's a lot to it. I can, I can simply fail over, but does that show me what the load is? Like, would I still be able to maintain and run it at an appropriate speed and what's good enough? So, so uh, Peter, are you seeing organizations today that are actually, you know, all have run books and, and proper, proper processes when, they, when, a, when a breach does occur or are they, are they not prepared? Um. A lot of people have the run books, a lot of people test those annual backups, but they're not going through the real life scenarios of, of bringing the incident uh, response plan and the security response plan, the containment plan 
and bringing all the folks together in, in tabletop type exercises to really validate that you are you are really prepared and you have the ability of actually executing that plan um, efficiently and uh, comprehensively. Um, every, I believe the organizations we've been working with, a lot of them are prepared, but the testing and the frequency of that testing, you, you can't do those annual backup um, tests annually anymore. I, I, I'll go so far to say you need to do some type of testing monthly and make sure your people are, are aware, even if you have dedicated folks to just being on standby to, uh, to help with the various different departments that are required to, to bring an organization back online. Thank you. So actually, I'll direct this question to Michael. Uh, so Michael, what if I can't get insurance? What do I do? Well, that is happening with increasing frequency. <laughs> so, you know, and it's problematic because if you can't get insurance for some reason, it's usually because you don't have, you're not insurable because you have poor controls. Uh, so your only other option, I guess, is is to self-insure. But if you're going to self-insure, which means you're going to take on all that risk yourself, your balance sheet's going to take 100% of the brunt of that, well, then you have to manage your risk well, um, which means you got to have all of these things we talked about in place, and you're probably going to have to seek the assistance of some third party who is going to either assist uh, or take full control of it, or at least, you know, provide some oversight to your team to make sure that what they're doing is adequate. Um, but I would say the biggest problem is, that's uh, one of the bigger problems that's emerging, is that it's a contractual requirement. You have to have it. So when you can't get it, it causes a big problem. You are in breach of contract. Um, you know, you can't issue, we can't issue you a certificate of insurance that says you have it when you don't have it. So it, it, it sets a whole whack of dominoes in place uh, when you can't get the insurance. Interesting. Um, I, have a, I have a question here from one of our attendees. Our key technology platform is Salesforce. Does relying on Salesforce's security practices and protocols provide us with more, us more confidence that we are secure as opposed to running our own infrastructure? follow up uh, as relatively small organizers, can we actually get Salesforce to respond to our concerns about uh, cybersecurity? That uh, maybe it goes out to both Andrew and Peter. Andrew, why don't you take a crack at it first because there's a legal aspect uh, that needs to be checked on first. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, so I've dealt with Salesforce <laughs> on behalf of a number of clients. Um, does relying on their practices and protocols provide you with confidence that you're secure? Well, yes and no, because whatever they say they're going to do, that's all well and good, as with any vendor. But at the end of the day, a lot of it boils down to, okay, if that doesn't go the way it's supposed to, to what extent are they going to be accountable or liable for that failure? And that's where um, sometimes you run into a problem because if you say, okay, we'll contract with Salesforce to do the work, they should have a better level of security, et cetera, et cetera. But if they fall down, I can only recover, I'll use a silly example, $100 worth of damages. Well, the contract was all really good, uh, except for that part, which was critical to you um, in terms of ultimately when, when you know, the rubber hits the road, to what extent are you actually going to be covered for your loss if you don't have appropriate insurance? So it, de it depends. They'll provide you the service, but what's the level of accountability under the contract? And then the second part, uh, can you actually get Salesforce to respond to your concerns? I mean, I'll leave it to Peter from uh, you know, perhaps an operational perspective, but I can say that from a contractual perspective, what I hear, and not just from Salesforce, but other vendors is, we're not your insurers. We're not guaranteeing you that we won't be hacked. Um, our contracts are not negotiable. And some of them tend to be quite inflexible with that. Like they stick to that very strongly. And they might say, well, listen, if you want a higher level of, of protection and you want more accountability, we can provide that to you, but that's at a different price point. So, you know, those are the types of things that, that I've experienced in dealing with Salesforce and other vendors like them. That actually, Andrew, that's that's the key. Um, 
what happens if if the platform Salesforce or NetSuite or you pick pick any any platform? What happens if that platform is not a, not available to the business? Can the business operate in one way or another without the platform, or is that or is business dead? If the business is dead, you have to look at um, well, what's it going to take to have the extra services online in order to keep me running in case the primary services is not available? And further to that, if the entire platform goes out, um, God forbid, say something like Azure, the entire, all the regions go down, what is your business continuity plan? You can't just um, believe that um, the contract will, will um, stand up when you actually need to have the services running. They, they, they need to run in parallel. Yeah, and uh, to that point, and I'm, I'm not sure where it'll go, but today there's an assumption by a lot of people that you know another service that's being used by everybody is, is, is Office 365. And you know, it's very, uh, wasn't understood, but is more understood today that you are responsible for the data, not Microsoft. Uh, that means you still have to take precautions and that means you have to do your own backups uh, of your Office 365 data. And a lot of organizations are not aware of that. And, and it's in OneDrive where you have your file folders. It's in, in mail. They have a certain amount of retention, but actually uh, it does expire over a period of time. And we can send, if, if anybody wants to request that information, we can send that out to them on the, aware, uh, on, <clears throat> on the awareness document of, of customer and vendor responsibilities. And I think you're gonna see the same thing come through with you know, Salesforce and these other, other organizations as well. Yeah, you need to copy your data outside the platform that you're using and relying that's, on. That, that's right, 100%. Um, and one of the, uh, somebody asked me, they didn't, I don't have their name here. So if you want to send me an email, I'm happy, happy to address uh, whether we have a security awareness training program that we can recommend. And yes, we do. So we're happy to do that uh, on a uh, on a one by one basis. Um, well, I think we're closing in on two minutes to go. And, uh, you know, we're happy to take any questions that you have um, in, in particular. Uh, please reach out to us or your, you know, if you've got a carbon rep, a carbon 60 uh, representative today, you know, please reach out to them or reach out to us and uh, to the company and or myself at dave.clark at carbon60.com. And I'll be happy to, uh, to get the information that you need or help you with anything that we can do. I'd like to thank our presenters, uh, all, all of you today. Uh, I think it was a great session, but you know, <laughs> hopefully we, we had a good effect on everybody. We had uh, only a few people drop off on time and we appreciate that. Uh, we had uh, over 57 people on the line at, at one point in time. So we certainly appreciate your time today. You, as I mentioned, the, the recording will be sent to you, the link uh, through email. And in a couple of days time, you can uh, order in lunch on Uber Eats. So thank you once again, everybody, and uh, have a terrific weekend and, uh, and a holiday season. And thank you to our friends down in the U.S. for joining us. Take care.